Hello there, Steve's Cafe again, and I have a real treat today in that I'm going to be talking to my son, whom I follow on Twitter because he is an often quoted expert on certainly some of the aspects of the whole Brexit issue. And since I'm a bit confused about Brexit, I'm going to ask Eric some questions. So, first of all, Eric, what I see from your research and from comments that you're retweeting is that even though there is 50,000 or however many thousand people demonstrating uh, in London in favor of staying in the European Union, essentially the 52%, half the population of the UK that voted in favor of Brexit are still pretty well committed to Brexit. Is that correct? Froze. <laughs> Since then, which have confirmed... Sorry. Say that again because the screen froze. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, they've done uh, some, some polling since the vote, and that's shown that something like 95% of those who voted to leave are pleased with that vote, and there's only a very small number who are remorseful, maybe 3 4%. But equally, on the, of, the, of those who voted remain, there's a couple of percent that would, you know, would have changed their vote to leave. So in a way, it's not really changed much in terms of the picture. I should point out that you are a professor of political science at uh, Birkbeck College, University of London, and that you do a lot of work with demography and analyzing different groups in society and their positions and so forth and maybe reasons why people behave certain ways and so forth and so on. What have you found in so far as uh, what motivates people one way or the other? What kinds of people tend to want to leave the European Union? What kinds of people tend to want to remain? Yeah, well, this is uh, there's two kind of big arguments. One is that it's about people's material interests and whether if they're poor, they voted against, or voted in favor of leaving the EU because they weren't felt they weren't getting any of the benefits, and if they were wealthier, uh, they voted to remain because that's where their self-interest lies. And part of my argument is that that difference about whether you're rich or poor has virtually no effect, had virtually no effect on somebody's decision whether to vote Brexit or not. Uh, it's much more to do with cultural values, uh, whether you are essentially liberal or conservative, or some would use the terms uh, open or closed uh, in terms of cultural values. Really? So how would you... How do you describe someone? So what's typically a person who's got, who is open or has more liberal cultural values? What sort of attitudes, what sort of positions do they take? I mean, try and explain this. <clears throat> I don't fully understand the difference between right. the two. So, so you, traditionally there's been this left-right divide between people who, on the left, who want to have more taxation and redistribution of wealth and on the right who want a smaller state, more free enterprise, less tax. That's kind of the old division. The new division is essentially, it doesn't matter whether you are uh, left or right, what's more important is whether you are, uh, whether you like novelty, change, and diversity, or whether you prefer uh, continuity, stability, certainty, uh, and, and, and tradition. So that's kind of the new, and that cuts across, so you can have somebody who might be a manual worker who's maybe left wing in terms of wanting more union power or redistribution of wealth, but who is in favor of tradition, national identity, and, and is against immigration. So that kind of person would be seen as culturally conservative, and that would be a Brexit voter. Okay. Now, the Brexit, vote, Brexit voter is someone who wants stability. It seems to me that uh, the whole Brexit referendum, and now the process of negotiating a deal, and nobody knows what that deal is going to be insofar as access to the market and, and, and control of immigration and so forth and so on, and political instability. In fact, it's, it's a bigger adventure. It, it introduces more instability. So why are these people who crave stability voting in favor of the unknown? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. But I think they are more interested in culture, the stability of their identity in their country and their national identity over time, the cultural stability. They're not as... I don't think the economic stability, and, and many of them don't perceive all this instability because they're not seeing the value of their property drop a lot or their stock portfolio. I mean, they're not really wealthy people. Uh, no, sorry, that's not 
We got to, I apologize again occasionally here. The idea that their country, yeah, so they're much more worried that their country has changed beyond recognition and that the things that they take comfort from are shifting under their feet. They're much more worried about that kind of stability than they are about a little bit of economic stability, instability. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's some of the same uh, motivation that pushes people to vote for Trump, no matter how ridiculous his statements are? I, I think it's identical, exactly the same. It's exactly the same profile. Like this, so, for example, people who are in favor of capital punishment, who are skeptical of climate change, who are sort of skeptical of the liberal elite, um, who would think that it's more important to discipline children than to let them explore. You know, that kind of person is, is simply going to be much more likely to vote Brexit. And Trump. Because, and Trump. Yes, right. and right. so and there, so a lot of the attention focuses on things that are visible: mm -hmm. rich, poor, uh, rural, urban, young, old, educated, not educated. That's actually less, much less important than the invisible differences. However, I did see the statistics that showed that the degree of support for remaining was highest amongst the sort of twenty to thirty year olds, like even seventy five percent. And then it dropped to 55% for the 30 to 50 year olds. And then those older than 50 were much stronger in favor of Brexit. Yeah. So it, it does, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. It does make some difference. Right. But there's still 30% of the under 25s or so that voted for uh, Brexit. Right. And so, and, and if you look at, if you break it down, even if you control for, you know, take two individuals who are 25 years old, male, white, um, the differences between them is more important than the differences between them and an older person. So it's the it's the, the invisible attitude and personality differences which count for about three three to four times more than the visible things such as age, class, mm -hmm. and so on. And you could argue that the people over 50 are by nature more concerned about stability, continuity, tend to be a little more authoritarian, whereas the younger right. people are more adventurous and, and wanting to explore. Right. So, and, and so to, to some extent, being poorer, being uh, rural, being older, less educated will increase your tendency towards what's called authoritarianism, which I think is a poor word, but desire for stability mm -hmm. uh, will be increased but that's but that only explains about 10 percent of someone's desire for stability it's it's still not largely demographic so the threat to this sense of their you know some sense stable sense of identity was the threat perceived to be the fact that brussels had too much power and was interfering in their lives or the immigration from the eu or the immigration from non-EU sources. So where is the threat to their stability? Well, I think the, 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 for most of the people, loss of sovereignty to the EU actually was not very important. And you could see that because the, the issue of Europe has always had a low salience, which means it's one of the, uh, in terms of when people are asked, what's the most important issue for you, it always ranked pretty low. Because most people don't even know what it is. They don't... I'll wait here again for the our Skype connection to improve. Hello, Eric. I'm waiting. It's frozen again. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Okay, start again. We'll have we'll yeah. have a few scenes of you freezing in the in the interview. That's okay. Oh, okay. Not a problem. All right. So, so you said low salience for this whole issue of the Brussels yeah, yeah. sovereignty. So yeah, so sovereignty and uh, the powers that the EU is taking from Britain is was not a major issue. Right. It was the only people that was an issue for were the elite of right. the Leave campaign, right. particularly Boris Johnson and some of the individuals you may or may not have heard of, such as you know. Anyway, you may or may not have heard of the elite. But the Gov, elite of the Leave Gove, however you pronounce his name. Not so much. Yeah, Gove and people like. Um, Douglas Carr as well, okay. Daniel yeah, yeah, Hannon and these people. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the elite, that fired them up, but for the mass of the voters, it was about immigration. And I'd say equal amounts, East European and non-European immigration, mm -hmm. uh, both of those things. See, one thing that strikes the foreign observer like me is that uh, getting out of the Euro European Union doesn't increase or decrease or affect the ability of Britain to control non-European immigration. 
Yeah, I think that's right, except for the fact you could have transiting via a third country. So it could be the case that people might come from, let's say, Syria to Germany and then come over to Britain. Uh, and right, right, but in reality, that wasn't happening. If anything, no. the European Union was a bit of a buffer, almost like you have that camp in Calais and so forth. That was kind of protecting Britain from this onslaught, if that was the concern. And and I saw statistics that showed that non-EU immigration, in fact, was declining. And you pointed out at one point too that the increase in sort of non-white, call it, uh, citizens of UK was more a function of. Uh, of um, higher birth rates than increased yeah. immigration. Yeah, I think so. I think, however, in the public mind, like some of the uh, posters that Nigel Farage, who's leader of the uh, far right party called the UK Independence Party, was showing posters of long lines of migrants uh, coming, suggesting that you know, without a control over immigration, these people could simply flow into Britain, which is not accurate, but. Essentially, they played up these fears, and, right. and in the minds of most of their voters, they didn't necessarily make these fine distinctions between right. European and non-European. Now, the um, of course, there's many arguments. You know, uh, one of the uh, you mentioned that uh, Nigel Farage, and I don't understand myself. Like Nigel Farage was not, in fact, the leader of the Leave campaign, but he's probably the strongest and longest-standing critic of the European Union. With, with a degree of spleen and, and vindictiveness in anything he says, he's almost spitting blood when he mentions the word yeah, European right. Union. So he's the strongest opponent. But he was, in fact, not leader of the, the leader of the Leave campaign. The leader of the Leave campaign was Boris Johnson, who people now claim at heart actually was a Remainer. Right. I, well, I'm confused. Whether he was a, I, I mean, I, I think he was probably a sort of fence sitter i don't think he had strong views either way right he but he was kind of he speaks i don't know if he speaks european languages but he certainly knows quite a bit about other european countries and has a kind of very multi-ethnic background and he's quite comfortable in europe and so why was he leading the leave campaign what's that was he well, not the leader of the leave campaign he was the leader it's one of the i wouldn't say the leader but probably the most prominent uh, spokesman uh, fronting the campaign, and which was cons consisted of really two wings: the Farage wing, which was not was the unofficial campaign, whose job it was largely to beat the bushes in some of these rural areas, and and he did probably manage to rouse more people to the polls because there was quite a high turnout in some of these depressed constituencies that often have low turnout mm -hmm. actually turned out in large numbers, and that helped the Leave campaign. Um, but in any case, Johnson, yeah, I mean, he partly was making a political calculation that he could um, become maybe, I mean, of course, he later dropped out of the race, but right. the, the calculation might have been that he could be prime minister by riding the... Uh, well, we have another moment here of frozen connection, but hopefully it'll... There we go. Okay, next question. It strikes me that... Uh, so people are, are resentful. Like, there's all these... Undoubtedly exaggerated, but still, you know, increased uh, anecdotes of people, you know, saying nasty things to Spanish, Polish, uh, in other words, both to non-European origin, you know, call them non-white immigrants and or to people speaking, uh, you know, a European language and stuff like that. Now, presumably, to some extent, there was that. I mean, the resentment, if there is resentment, must and, and I presume it's not like totally dominant all over British society, but there were elements that felt that way. Has that, do you really feel that that, the incidence or the, the amount of anti-foreign feeling in the UK has, has dramatically risen since Brexit? Now again, we're frozen here a bit. Wait for it to unfreeze. Uh, yeah. Did you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I did. Um, I don't think there, I mean, there's, there have been more reports of those, um, comments or, or I'm not sure about attacks but there have been more comments I think there might have been a brief you know a brief flurry of that but I don't think it's really evident uh, certainly not on the streets of London mm -hmm. and I think it, I would be surprised if there is a lot of it going on so yeah I think probably some people used it as a license to, mm -hmm. to, to maybe you know, make, make comments but I don't think it's anything yeah it's too bad that our 
don't think it's going to last. Yeah. Like one thing I noticed, Eric, and I'll talk because I think your screen is frozen now. But you can hear me, right? No, we're stopped here. Hello. Okay. Hello? Yeah. So, I mean, when, when I was in London, if I go to a restaurant, everybody working there is some kind of European, basically. Spanish, right. Italian, Polish. I mean, you, basically, they, they're everywhere. So right. now I, I gather Theresa May, who's one of the candidates for the leadership of the Conservative Party, is saying the status of these EU citizens in the UK is, uh, can't be taken for granted or, or something. So it suggests that the, those people may not be able to stay or, or what's, ga what's actually going to happen there or do we just not know? Well, I think, they, I think they will be able to stay, but I do think that uh, Theresa May, who looks like she's going to be emerging as the uh, leader of the Conservatives and thus the Prime Minister, given the fragmentation of the right. UK pol political system, um, is probably got an, an eye on the longer term negotiations with the EU. And so, you know, they have, has to think about what bargaining chips she holds in those negotiations. Right. And this is one bargaining chip, presumably. Now, I think, I don't have any doubt in the world that, that uh, the status of the all the EU people that are already in the country is fine, but it's still, I think, something that she's probably wielding as a way of trying to get leverage on the EU, because the EU is is claiming various things that they're going to going to drive a hard bargain. So I think Britain needs to have some uh, some cards to play. Okay, but but the, the the counterpart to that is all the EU, all the British uh, citizens who live uh, have homes uh, in France and Spain and so forth and so on. I mean, you can't really hold these people as hostages to the negotiation. I mean, isn't it more about things like access to British markets for German cars or British access to European markets, or even the whole issue of uh, Britain's role as a financial center insofar as European financial markets are concerned. I mean, uh, why do the people, like, it seems to me a little bit cynical and, and probably empty, as you're confirming, to hold out these people as some kind of a bargaining chip. Uh, yeah, I think it is, and I think, yeah, she's taking some stick on that. I don't think that'll last, but I think ultimately it comes down to these negotiations, which will be essentially about how much you're going to trade your access to the single market for some control over free movement. And I suspect the final deal will be almost free market access and almost free movement. So I don't, so I think that will be yeah. the final deal. It'll be, you know, some variant of that. I think there won't, Britain won't get control of its borders and it will, and that will be maybe put to the people. And, and, so, and, but so in the end, you started out by saying that the real, the whole sovereignty, the role of Brussels issue, Brussels was not very important to people. But in the end, they'll end up with a deal that is not very different from what they have now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it will be very similar. And so what will happen is you're going to get, and it's already building, this sense of being sold out right. that will occur amongst the farageist right. rump of the leave vote, but it's but the leave vote was fifty two percent. So maybe in that fifty two percent, you know, if forty five percent of that or forty percent of that is driven by immigration, and you've still got about five to ten percent, perhaps that is really about sovereignty and and. We'll wait it out here. Sorry, Eric. I might get. Uh... Hello. Hi. 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 You know what? I am. When we finish this, uh, I can get yeah. Annie, our granddaughter, yeah. my granddaughter, uh, your uh, niece, to go in and she can edit out the parts where your face is all kind of contorted in a frozen okay. look. So that's so we'll, we'll clean it up. So um, yeah. So they may end up more or less with what they have now, more or less right. along the Norway model. Yeah, pretty much a Norway model. Maybe a little. Some guarantee that if the numbers go over some ceiling that Britain will be able to then control some sort of controls on free movement that are very symbolic and very limited. Mm -hmm. And then at the other end, they won't complete unfettered access to the market. That would be my guess. Now, and one other issue. You said that people, once yeah. the people discover that, in fact, the uh, control on immigration, whether it be EU origin, non-EU origin... Uh, it, it's going to be not very different from what it is now, like 95% right. the same, that people will feel they've been uh, sold a bill of goods. 
Is there any reaction to the fact that these promises like 350 million pounds to the health system and, uh, and well, first of all, uh, this pictures of hordes of people coming in. And in fact, that hasn't changed. And in fact, I, and I saw interviews on the BBC or whatever network where Han, 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 whatever the guy's name was, Han, yeah. was claiming, well, we never said that we'd be uh, controlling right. immigration. And then this 350 million pounds of the national health system is not going to happen. And uh, and I saw a study somewhere, too, that showed that, um, in fact, the younger working age EU immigrants are less of a burden on the health system. In fact, the, the right. you know, taxes in versus benefits uh, that they take out, uh, they're better performers than the average of the somewhat older, uh, you know, call it the British society as a whole. So actually, they benefit the health system. Uh, right. Which I can understand, because a 30-year-old uh, Pole is not going to be on the health system as much as a 65-year-old right. Brit. Yeah, and that's all true, and there's no question they are an economic benefit. Um, mm. You know, I think that's fairly well documented. But I think it's not about, it's not really about kind of cost-benefit, not really about material things. That's part of my argument, is it's right. really about values, identity. It's essentially about the, the majority ethnic group not wanting to decline. And so, so therefore, though, if I interrupt, so therefore, yeah. Farage's uh, posters with hordes of Syrians or something wanting to come in the country was a much more persuasive ad than 350 million pounds to the health system. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I mean, I think the 350 was more people will take that and they'll believe that, but it's not what drove them. I think right. what drove them fundamentally was about values. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, and yes, so what will happen eventually is that when they see that there's no change, a lot of those disgruntled people will go to Farage and away from the, the you know, some of them are Tory voters, some of them are Labour voters, but I think that Farage will benefit, but he doesn't have enough. He might have 30 percent or 35, so it's not enough to scuttle a deal. But so do you see then that in the long run that the uh, UK Independence Party will just get stronger and stronger? Well, they'll become like the Front National, like the PVV in the Netherlands, where there'll be a significant party, I think, mm -hmm. um, protest party, but they won't be enough to to come into government. And, and, of course, in Britain, there's the first-past-the-post system, which heavily disadvantages a party like UKIP. So they won't right. be able to get many seats. Mm -hmm. Even if they have 30% of the vote, they're, they're not going to be able to have, have many seats. Uh, <laughs> All right. Whereas what? in the Netherlands, yeah. the PVV has a lot of seats because of their their voting system. Now I'll uh, ask you to dip into another area of your expertise, and that is because you have written a book on the Orange Order and you've spent a lot of time right. in Northern Ireland. And uh, one of the, the issues is potential second referendum in Scotland. And also, uh, if the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic becomes the border between the EU and uh, and Britain, then I saw where there was a rush on Irish passports in uh, in Ulster <laughs> and stuff like that. And of course, the Catholics in Northern Ireland are going to use this as as a drum they can beat on to uh, unite with Ireland. What's going to happen in your view uh, up north there between Scotland and Northern Ireland? Well, the, the Scotland thing's quite. Uh quite interesting of course scotland they some of the polls that i've seen show somewhere between 52 and 59 percent now saying they're in favor of independence in the polls which is actually you know which is considerably higher which well the polls up until the referendum when uh, the independence movement lost 55 45 still showed a slight majority of scots saying that they would vote for independence. So in a way, they almost need to be on 60% to be guaranteed an outvote. Right. Uh, and they're kind of on the cusp of that, but the problem is that now the EU has, because of Spanish pressure, Spain, because of the Catalans, doesn't want to set a precedent. Right. So that's the EU top brass have essentially cold-shouldered Sturgeon and the, and the uh, Scots. Uh, and so in a way, any hope that they could simply unilaterally just join the EU has been dashed. The UK has to sign up to this article, negotiate its position, and only then will the Scots come in, and then they're going to be in the back of the line. So essentially, they're looking at, at an indefinite period, even if they did get the vote. And right. what that means is Sturgeon is going to be unable to tell her supporters that, that we're automatically in the EU and it'll happen quick. Right. 
so it's it's going to be hard. Right. Um, harder than people have thought. And uh, so it's not clear Scotland's going to go, first of all. Uh, and then secondly, yeah, Northern Ireland definitely won't go. But what's happening in Northern Ireland is, yeah, the Unionists voted probably even more than the English <laughs> to leave. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> I would love to see the breakdown, but it's going to be quite strongly Brexit amongst the Protestants, right. and then the the Catholics would have voted almost unanimously Remain. Uh, so that's and the population there is fifty fifty, right? It's about fifty fifty. It's maybe slightly more Protestant still. Mm-hmm. Um, some Protestants would have voted uh, Remain because there's the strong agricultural industry there, which relies on EU subsidies, and mm-hmm. Protestant farmers and, and interests would have voted Remain for that reason. Um, now, the other thing, of course, is that there's a, right now an open border because both countries are in the EU. That would no longer be open. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, a lot of all, – all people in Northern Ireland are eligible for an Irish passport. So they may – a lot of people are trying to get these passports just so that they have unfettered access to the EU, including Protestants. Staunch um, unionists. So unionists. Yes. So as part of the view there, you know, some Irish nationalists are thinking, oh well, this is kind of United Ireland through the back door if, if all the of Northern Ireland takes up Irish citizenship. Yeah. Um, but then the others worry that there's going to be what's called a hard border, which means passport checks and customs checks uh, on the right. border, which is symbolically seen by the Irish nationalists as an impediment to. Uh, unification of Ireland. Right. And the last point then, since you mentioned yeah. Spain, and maybe this a little further from your area of expertise, what's the likelihood yeah. that something will happen in Gibraltar? Because uh, the, the Gibraltar, of course, voted overwhelmingly in favor of Remain. I mean, yeah. they're just across the border. It's the same situation as in Ireland. Uh, yet, they, one of the major arguments that Britain has always used why they don't want to give up Gibraltar is that the people there overwhelmingly want to remain a part of, remain a part of the UK. Uh, now, the European Union will be presumably quite supportive of any Spanish effort to change the status of Gibraltar in some way. Have you any sense of what might happen there? I don't have a, I don't have a good sense of that. I mean, I, I, part of it will depend on the deal because what's there's something called Article 50, which is once Britain gives notice to the EU right. of its intention to leave, then they have a two-year window in which to negotiate a deal. Right. They don't want to sort of give them that notice because that then that puts Britain under under the gun. Right. Uh, so what what's going to I think happen is there's going to be jockeying to and fro so that the outlines of a proposed deal will emerge hopefully in the next you know six months or so. Um, and that once the outlines of a deal are there, then the financial markets and so on will get a bit more certainty, and then Britain will then proceed to, to negotiate. But what might happen, therefore, is Gibraltar will see, see what the outlines of this deal are. If they include more or less free movement then and more or less free trade, then maybe Gibraltar will be not that affected. So maybe right. that will then calm them down. Right. Uh, so that's the current thinking. All right. Okay. <laughs> Super. I'm going to uh, okay. end this interview. I will stay on the line. We can chat some more. Yeah. But thank you. I think that's really great. And um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Oh, I should. Uh, yeah. I should just point out that the, this discussion will be transcribed and will be available right. as a lesson at Link for those people whose okay. uh, language, you know, uh, native language isn't English. So they can use this, I think, very interesting discussion. You've, you know, provided a lot of clarity and they can also improve their English by studying it at Link. So, bye for now. Bye-bye.